opportunity and congratulations with the 50 years anniversary. So, um, we have looked into uh, ultra low uh, temperature district heating booster station. It's a project that is funded by the Danish Energy Agency. The budget is like 20 million. Danfoss made, among others, four demonstrations, and I would like to share with you one of the demonstrations, which is just a small part of the project. It's a part of the Energy Lab know-how. It's an area in Copenhagen where a old tax-free harbor is converted into a living area. You can imagine everyone wants to live in the center of Copenhagen, and basically only the harbor area was left to do some building development. It's very popular, and it's actually, it seems, even though prices are sky high, it's sold very easy. Um, the building we are looking at, you see it to the picture to the left, it's uh, 22 flats, it's built five years ago, and the idea is actually to supply this building with ultra-low temperature district heating. That means a supply temperature of approximately 40 or 45 degrees. Could be the return temperature from an existing, coexisting, let's say, district heating network. Um, to the picture to the right, you can see the system itself. There are some storage tanks, there are some automatics, some controllers, and there are also two heat pumps. Um, because the building uses underfloor heating, here 40, 45 degrees is more than enough, but for domestic hot water we need to boost the temperature so that we can get domestic hot water at 55 degrees. The system itself, you can actually see here, so the ultra-low temperature district heating is coming in at 45 degrees Celsius, then a heat pump is heating up here mentioned the main heat pump, the water to around 60 degrees, and then we store it. This heat pump runs approximately one to three hours per day, depending on the domestic hot water usage. Uh, that means we can run the heat pump when it's smart. And this is also what this is about, to run the heat pump when electricity and district heating prices are low. Then we produce the domestic hot water in the traditional way with an instantaneous uh, heat exchanger. A challenge in this kind of buildings is the circulation water, because the circulation water from the domestic hot water comes back with 50 degrees. And if that is directly heated by district heating, it would yield a very high return temperature. That's why we also put in a small circulation heat pump that is able to heat the circulation water up from the 50 to the 55, and at the same time give a low district heating return temperature. There are some flexibilities that are important. I mean, in Denmark, everybody talks about sector integration and flexibility. So here, we would like to bring the flexibility of domestic hot water into play. So generate the energy for the uh, domestic hot water at times that makes good sense, but also look a little bit about the sector coupling between electricity and heating. That means that we should operate the heat pump, which are using electricity, when it's smart also from the electricity point of view. When it comes to flexibility, then it's about when to charge the tank, but it could also be how are we operating the main heat pump. I mean, what is the condensing temperature, what is the evaporating temperature. It, it swaps the CUP and by that the share between electricity consumption and district heating consumption. And uh, also the source of the energy for the circulation heat pump, it can be from the tank, it can be from the ultra-low temperature district heating supply. But the flexibility I would like to uh, talk to you about is basically flexibility one. So when to charge the tank. And, well, what we need to know is when is the domestic hot water tapped? That means we need to build up a system that can predict during the day what is the profile of domestic hot water tapping. Together with the actual charging level of the tank, we can make a plan when to charge the tank in times that makes good sense. Okay, this is how the system operates, uh, how much usable water is in the tank, because there's district heating water in the tank. You can see to the left different temperatures. This is a 24-hour profile, and the main message is when this blue line in the bottom over the day is rising, that is basically the tapping profile for this building with 22 flats. And then you can see every time there's a tapping, the temperature, of course, drops in the tank because we take the energy out. And then from time to time, you need to charge it. And that is when you have those, uh, those squares up. Uh, you can see this. There are five charging over the day. Uh, and why are we charging at those times? Uh, that is because the system figured out that would be nice time to charge it. But let's look more into deep with the domestic hot water. Uh, 
This is a typical profile over a day, and now we sampled every 10 seconds. Uh, you know, when you start this kind of project, you just want to sample as much as possible, but then afterwards you figure out all those tons of data, that's basically a burden. So of course you need to fill it a little bit. But based on this here, this is a Wednesday, then we can ask the question how to forecast tomorrow, or maybe the next Wednesdays, and are there some seasonal variations on domestic hot water? So this is an intraday. This says how is exactly the contribution over the day. But of course, the total tapping per day is also uh, relevant in terms of looking at what are the seasonal variations. Just to cut the data a little bit out, in the top left picture, you have basically the same picture again. Then I aggregated it, so I say instead of looking every 10 seconds, it's enough to look every 15 minutes, so you get the blue curve. And in the right side, you actually can see the aggregated data from Monday to Friday. And you can see the domestic hot water patterns from Monday to Friday are quite similar, whereas in the weekend, it's more problematic. So it's very logic. If you, are, if you are, would like to predict domestic hot water, let's say, from Monday to Friday, it's much easier because people have a regular pattern. They go to work, they come home, they take a shower, and so on. But in the weekend, people, they have much more chaotic uh, schedules. And that you easily can see that, that this Saturday and Sunday, they are very different. Uh, this is actually the data for one year and four months. Now I plot the total consumption over the day. And you can actually see that in the summer, consumption is lower. In the winter, it is actually higher. And then you can see some outliers. And, and those outliers, uh, I can try to show on the next slide is typically when there's a vacation. And uh, you can also see that it seems to be like a seasonal trend. There's a lot of noise, so there's a lot of stochastic effects here. So there's a coincidence how much people are tapping. That's why the dots are so in this uh, band. But, uh, but nevertheless, there seems to be a pattern. This we can look at here. I put in a tre trend line for one year. It's basically just a sinus curve. That is good to know when you want to do the prediction. And then the blue ones, I consider that as outliers. That is the Christmas holiday, the Eastern holiday, and the summer holiday, basically. So people are using much less water during the Christmas or other holidays. Um, but you also can see that in average, the volume, the domestic hot volume that is tapped is like 1,800 liters. And the trend curve has an amplitude of 250 liters. But the variation between days can easily be, be, be plus minus 500 liters per day. Uh, so there is just a certain error. How do we then forecast it? Yeah, basically what we do, we do some autoregressive method. So we say that let's forecast tomorrow, that's the Friday. We know nothing about Friday. Let's wait to see what the data for Friday is. Then we know what the past Friday has been for the profile. That will be the prediction for the next Friday. And then when we have the data, from the next Friday, we basically take a weight between the previous forecast and the actual data to use to use to for forecast the next Friday again. So it's an autoregressive method, and then with a seasonal compensation. Somebody calls it ARIMA models, uh, but that is the that is the principle. It's very simple, basically, but you can always argue how complicated forecast model you should do in case that the, the, the load on the system or the domestic hot water draw-off is so stochastic. Um, it's just hard to predict how people behave if you really want it in details. A little bit about the forecast and the actual data. You can see the red uh, circles is, uh, is the actual data. The blue one is the forecast. So we basically get a filtered forecast. We do not have so much amplitudes, but we can also see that we're able to follow the yearly trend. And this forecast we then use on a daily level. This I will skip due to the time. Two minutes? OK, I will try. Here you see some examples between forecast and actual data on domestic hot water for, for each of them for 24-hour uh, period. And you can actually see that, that those days that are, are, are normal weekdays, the forecast is much better than in the weekends. You can also see that also over the day, the forecast will be more filtered than the actual data. Yeah. So a little bit about how much load are we then able to shift. And here you actually can see this is a data for a year. And you can see that in average, 72 kilowatt hours per day we are using for domestic hot water with a big seasonal variation. Uh, that is then the domestic hot water consumption. If we split that out, 
to district heating and electricity, it's about 65 kilowatts hour per day in average flexibility on district heating, and it's like six and a half kilowatt per day in average for electricity. So those amounts of energy we are able to shift. Okay, here we see a profile over the day again, and what is important here, if you just look at the red line, it is that, okay, there's tapping going on, the red line goes down, meaning the, 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 the usable uh, volume in the tank is going down, but then suddenly it steps up, that is when we are charging the tank, and the idea is then to, to charge the tank at the lowest energy cost, as late as possible, and, let's say, respecting the constraints of the, the usable water. Uh, the usable, uh, uh, the restrictions on how many liters of usable water we can have in the tank. And you can see the North Pole electricity cost and the simulated marginal district heating cost are put in as a price vector. So every time we, we, we charge, it is when the prices are low. And that leads me then to the conclusion. So, so, so we have run the system now almost for, for, for a bit more than one and a half year, and we can see that the system actually works very good. The, 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 the load flexibility we get from domestic hot water is at least on the same size as the flexibility if we look at the heating system in the buildings. A lot of, of, of concepts are actually on the market today where you avoid, let's say, to put energy into the be, uh, building, for instance, during the morning and the evening peak of the district heating system. This is possible because the thermal capacities of the buildings are so high. Uh, this study shows that also with domestic hot water, we can reach, let's say, same amounts of energy uh, uh, flexibilities. Yeah. So with those words, I would like to thank you very much for the attention. And I would also suggest that you look into the homepage of Energy Lab Know-How, where a whole range of different uh, experiments are described and uh, documented. Thank you very much uh, for the attention.